the, um, the thing that got overflowed in the a &I case looked like this. It was a structure that had a whole bunch of um, dwoofs, a whole bunch of integers. And then what happened is the file would get rid in. There would be a field in the file that had some untrusted length that the attacker could supply. And there would be a mem copy from that, um, using that untrusted header length, and it would just get copied into that structure. So that structure was a pick size, say 20 bytes. And if the file said, I've got an AI header structure of 2,000 bytes, then that mem copy would try and copy 2,000 bytes into that 20 byte struct. So clearly the issue there is that even though that ANI header struct is not a string and strings aren't being copied around, in practice any any buffer, anything that's been passed into a mem copy is potentially vulnerable to to, to being overflowed. It, it's been treated like a packed buffer and GS should maybe um, do likewise. So we looked back at past data, and we found that this wasn't isolated. So sure, GS has been very effective over the years at mitigating certain types of vulnerability. But in Exchange, in Office, and now in Windows, we had examples of cases where the kind of thing being overflowed wasn't something that GS would decide to mitigate. So an array of integers, GS said, that's not an array of um, characters. I'm not going to mitigate that. Um, in Office, in Publisher, and also in, um, in Windows for the ANI vulnerability. It was a structure and it was populated from file data that the attacker could control. So April 2007 when this happened, um, Vista had shipped and we were in the process of um, preparing Vista Service Pack 1. So the immediate issue for us was what can we do for Vista Service Pack 1 that will aim to close some of this gap? Now I mentioned before about um, a new pragma, StrictJS, that was introduced in Visual, Stu Visual Studio 2005. Um, now what StrictJS does is it tells the compiler to be much more aggressive in where it uses the GS mitigation. So any address taken on local variables is considered a potential target. So that would be good because it would cover the cases that, that we've just seen. Um, so all, all, all of those would have, would have been covered by StrictJS. The danger is that it would also cover cases like this. So here I've got a printf call and I'm passing in the address of integer i. Now if printf was malicious, it could use the address of i to write to the stack frame of main. So it could write to the address of i and it would overwrite the contents of i and then if it kept going it would overwrite um, kind of the save UDP, the return address of main and, and so on. Um, now the compiler has no way of knowing that printf isn't malicious. And so, under strict GS, the compiler would GS protect that function. So you can imagine the performance people at this point are getting nervous. So what did we do? We applied it in um, quite a targeted way. So we looked back during the list of pen test at components where we had found uh, bugs using file fuzzing, given that files were one of the primary ways that primary things, primary attack vectors that we were concerned about. Um, so a number of components uh, were identified that way. Um, as well as doing file parsing, we looked at components that did network parsing or other form of parsing like um, you know, consuming human user data. Um, now the, the reason for that is twofold. One is if you're parsing data from the network or a file, that's maybe going to be untrusted. Um, the other reason is if, if the component is already reading in data from the network or data from a file, the cost of that file I.O. or network I.O. is likely going to be um, a lot higher than the cost of the extra GS check instructions that we're going to be inserting. Um, so that's what we did. So there's a couple of figures there. Um, and I guess the numbers aren't hugely important, except that they're quite different. So you can see that the factor increase in number of GS protected functions, for the first couple, it was about a threefold increase. So three times as many cookies, well, that's probably all right. Um, the example down the bottom, 13-fold increase, one third of functions um, are GS protected. That's, that, that's the kind of thing that basically made it impossible for us to consider applying this system-wide. So for system-wide deployments, we were going to need something else. 
Um, you can think of the bit that when a breach has been targeted, it's like fortifying a couple of components um, that might be particularly vulnerable. Um, but the initial GIF design had been an on by default compiler switch. So that's more like a city wall that protects the, the entire code base. So the question now is, can we make the default slash GIF that ships in the compiler better? Um, the, the other benefit of making the default slash GIF better, of course, is that we don't only protect Windows code, we protect any code that's built with the Visual Studio 2010 compiler. So any code um, including non Microsoft code. The basic idea is that for security, we'd like to protect more stuff. Um, so protect some of those structs, protect some of those integer arrays um, that, that we've seen um, can be exploited. Um, but be smarter about coverage. Um, so we did, we did some analysis, and we found lots and lots of functions that were GS protected, where even cursory manual code review um, could have told you that that GS could use unnecessarily. So there are different ways of trying to work. So what, what should we protect? Um, ideally, from a security standpoint, all arrays, all structs. Um, performance concerns mean we probably can't do that. So we have to decide what subset of, of that is the most likely target for, um, for an overflow. Which subset is the most likely to contain untrusted data? So if you think about the contents of a file, a file could contain a string, a file could contain um, an array of D words, a file is unlikely to contain pointers referencing your own computer's memory. You're unlikely to read in a file and that, for that file to have a raw address to a local memory inside it. So for arrays, um, we decided we'll protect any array as long as the element type is not a pointer type. And we'll also not bother protecting tiny arrays, because there's a whole bunch of tiny arrays with um, two elements that aren't really being used as arrays. They're just they're always instantiated via angle brackets to zero, angle brackets to one, and there's never any known copy. The structures um, will use a similar kind of um, principle. Any structure containing an array where the element type is not a pointer type. So we're like in the A and I case. You have a structure that's just a whole bunch of U words, a whole bunch of data, then that will come to protect structures that are um, smaller than 8 bytes in size, or 8 bytes in size. 